Our baby Isaac was diagnosed with stage four cancer and needed surgery for a tumor that took up half his abdomen. His odds were the flip of a coin. But at Seattle Children's, he had one of the most experienced pediatric cancer surgical teams in the nation, and they brought him back to 100% himself. Maybe 200%. For kids with the most complex surgical cases, it's not about beating the odds, it's about changing them. Find your hope at seattlechildrens.org. did our consultation um, with Seattle Nanny, and then we hired the first one that we met. So that wasn't my intent by any means, but you know, we were just really impressed with her. Um, I think I did meet with one after her just because I was like, let's make Seattle Nanny do their job. For sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, and then Isabel was interviewing other places and we didn't want to let her go. So it wasn't a long process for us. Our baby Isaac was diagnosed with stage four cancer and needed surgery for a tumor that took up half his abdomen. His odds were the flip of a coin. But at Seattle Children's, he had one of the most experienced pediatric cancer surgical teams in the nation, and they brought him back to 100% himself. Maybe 200%. For kids with the most complex surgical cases, it's not about beating the odds, it's about changing them. Find your hope at seattlechildrens.org. did our consultation um, with Seattle Nanny, and then we hired the first one that we met. So that wasn't my intent by any means, but you know, we were just really impressed with her. Um, I think I did meet with one after her just because I was like, let's make Seattle Nanny do their job. For sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, and then Isabel was interviewing other places and we didn't want to let her go. So it wasn't a long process for us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brenna McCown, and I'm the events manager for Parent Map. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Parent Night Talk, How to Stop Fighting and Start Winning Together in Parenting and Marriage with authors Nate and Kaylee Clem. For those of you not familiar with Parent Map, just like our parenting media partners who've joined us from across the country today, it's our business to build inclusive communities that inform, engage, 
and inspire parents like you, your family, while having plenty of fun too. We're all extremely focused on how to better serve families and being the parents and publishers that we are, we never settle for the status quo. Our deep community connections, family advocacy, and unique partnerships allow us to help build a better village for our families. Before we begin today, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and may be republished for educational and promotional usage. And we will email everyone who registered a link to the recording after the event as well. We invite your questions, so please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen to submit any questions for Nate and Kaylee today. And also, Nate and Kaylee requested that you please have a piece of paper and pencil handy during the event. Thank you to our media partners, including Chicago Parent, Metro Parent, Baton Rouge Parent, New York Family, and NOLA Family. Also, big thank you to our event sponsors, Seattle Children's Hospital, Seattle Nanny Network, Wayne County Community College District, Allegro Pediatrics, and Pacific Medical Centers. Nate Klemp is a writer, philosopher, and entrepreneur. He and his wife, Kaylee Klemp, are the co-authors of the recently published book, The 8080 Marriage, a new model for a happier, stronger marriage. He's also the co-author with Eric Langsher of the New York Times bestseller, Start Here, Master of the Lifelong Habit of Well-Being, and he's a regular contributor to Inc. Magazine, Fast Company, and Mindful. Nate is a founding partner at Mindful, one of the world's largest mindfulness media and training companies. Nate holds a BA and MA in philosophy from Stanford University and a doctorate from Princeton University. Kaylee Klemp is also one of the nation's leading experts on small group dynamics and leadership development. A TEDx speaker and author with three books, including the Amazon bestseller, The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, The Drama-Free Office, and 13 Guidelines for Effective Teens. Kaylee is a graduate of Stanford University where she earned a BA in International Relations and an MA in Sociology with a focus on organizational behavior. Please join me in welcoming Nate and Kaylee Klemp. Hello, everyone. We are delighted to be here. Brenna, thank you for the wonderful introduction. As Brenna mentioned, tonight we want to do an exploration of how to invest in your relationship, in your marriage, specifically through the lens of parenting. And so tonight we'll have a chance both to explore the concepts from the 8080 marriage, but also to apply them specifically with you and your partner. So if you haven't yet grabbed that piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, that will be useful for our exploration. To get us started tonight, we first wanted to do some context around other kinds of books that you might have read. And as we present in the world, we often ask who's read a business book? And then we'll also ask the question, and in this environment, I imagine it's most, who has read a parenting book? And in our experience being authors of books in these genres, very often people are really happy to tell us about them. Kaylee and Nate, we have your book on our bookshelf. And yet there's something strange that happens when we come into the genre of marriage books. And what we discover is that all of a sudden people get a little squirrely about having a marriage book either prominently displayed on their shelf or as one person confessed to us, they said, we, I put the 8080 marriage in my Amazon cart and my partner came to me and said, are we okay? <laughs> and so there's something interesting that there are a bunch of myths out there that maybe we shouldn't have to read or invest in our relationships, that they should just be easy, or that we should just have love conquer all. And yet, we're so glad that you're joining us here tonight, because at least the story I'm making up is that you are intimately familiar with our experience and what we learned from our over 100 interviews, that marriage is actually more like doing sit-ups so that you have a strong core. It's not a one and done or a one-time fixes all, but rather an investment that you make over time. So we want to talk about marriage and parenting tonight through a slightly different lens than what you might be used to. And really, the question we're going to be asking tonight, we think of as the fundamental question that all modern couples are facing. And that's this. How can we be equals, manage the chaos of parenting and life? Because let's face it, life right now is a little bit chaotic. And stay in love. 
And I think the key parts to this question are essentially how can we be equals and stay in love? And the reason we think this is such an interesting and fundamental question is that it's a radically different question from the kinds of questions our parents might have been asking about their marriage and parenting, certainly very different from what our grandparents were asking. You know, there's some really interesting research in sociology showing that really our generation, the generation that's currently going through parenting with young children or adolescent kids, we're the first generation to have to navigate egalitarian marriage, this idea of being equals and in love. And in fact, there was a recent poll done by Pew Research where they asked how many Americans support the basic idea of equality in marriage. And you can imagine if this were done in the 1950s, what the numbers would be. But this was done several years ago, and they found 97% of Americans support this idea of equality in marriage, which I think is pretty interesting. If you think about how divided and polarized we are, that's the big narrative about Americans in particular, to have this kind of consensus is really quite amazing. So that's what we say at the level of principle. That doesn't mean that this is always how it works out at the level of practice. There's actually a lot of research showing that gender inequality still exists. There is still this hangover from the 1950s. Women still do more on basically every survey of household labor and childcare. But the gap between how much women do and how much men do has been closing. And we're moving toward this model of equality and co-parenting. So the question then is, okay, how do we be equals and in love? And what we found in our own life, we tried this for about a decade or so, is that the default answer to this question is this mindset of fairness. And as Kaylee mentioned, we also interviewed about 100 people, and we found that this was the central theme coming up again and again in conversations with this generation of couples. The idea was, well, I guess we'll be equals and in love by making everything perfectly 50-50 fair. And not only that, we're going to keep a mental tally or a scorecard that has all of my wonderful contributions juxtaposed against everything that Kaylee's done. And the idea is somehow if we reach perfect fairness and equality there, we're going to somehow ascend to marital bliss and everything's going to be great. Unfortunately for all of us, that's not actually how it works. And sometimes that mental tally actually becomes a real tally. So as we were doing our interviews and discussing this concept with people, somebody sent us their spreadsheet. This is how they were going to make things fair. They wrote every task that had to occur in their home. And then they divided who was doing what, who, you know, which things were divided. And my favorite thing, if you can see it on the slide, is that there was actually a line item that indicated when something had tipped over and become a super undesirable task. <laughs> What's interesting also about this is that fairness doesn't necessarily look exactly like household chores. There are actually six different faces of fairness that we found through our interviews, and we'll talk about four here tonight. The first is actually pretty well represented in this spreadsheet. This is about domestic scorekeeping. These are the things about, I was here to get the door for the cable guy and canceled an important meeting. The least you can do is to go to ballet class. It might also look like I just made dinner, and so clearly it's your job to do the dishes. Or I got up in the middle of the night to bring our child water, and that will cost you both a ride to school, mowing the lawn, and three trips to the trash can. <laughs> and one of the things that I think is helpful about identifying these faces of fairness is that when we ask couples, where does fairness show up for you? For the most part, they would say, uh, I don't really know, or like, we, we don't, don't really fight about argue fairness, about that. No. Right. So in many cases, it's living underneath the radar of our awareness. So in some ways, by just like pointing to these four aspects of how fairness shows up, it, it can help you start to see this arising in real time. So number two, one of our personal favorites mm -hmm. is the friends and extended family fight. And this was one where especially in the early days of our marriage, so this is about 15 years ago, we lived in California. Both sets of parents lived here in Colorado. 
each winter we would come back to visit our families and we would go through this elaborate process of making sure the amount of time spent with our various families was perfectly fair. So my family got Christmas Eve and Christmas. Her family got the next three days. They got a bonus day because they didn't get the actual holiday. Only fair. But then even though we would, had sort of ledgered out this perfect division, there ended up being this huge conflict over the exact time at which we would leave my parents' house to go to Kaylee's parents' house. Was it going to be 6.30? Was it going to be 7.30? So all that's to say, this is another way that this can show up and can show up with friends, with extended family, but it's this idea that everything has to be perfectly fair when it comes to our friends and family. As we look at the third face of fairness, which is this notion of feeling exhausted, we notice that this shows up in particular when you're parenting young children and that it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy to make sure that they are taken care of, fed, bathed, going to sleep, that all of their needs are the responsibility of the parents. And so this notion of dividing time at work and then with the family gets even more complex. Sometimes there also sneaks in a little bit of jealousy regardless of which side of this you're doing, that in some ways it feels like, oh my gosh, you are so lucky that you got to go spend eight hours out of the house where people actually do what you ask them to do. And then on the flip side, a person will say, oh my goodness, you are so lucky that you didn't have to do eight hours of exhausting meetings. Both people arrive home, look at the scope of work that still needs to be done for the family, and both feel in some ways entitled to those 10 minutes of peace but there's no way to get it without having someone else do it. And wow, does that feel unfair? And then one more we have to point out, which is related to the exhausted fight is the free time fight. And because we're talking about marriage and parenting tonight, I think this one is particularly important to highlight because as you all know, before kids in marriage, there's like this abundance of free time. You have all the time in the world to go on hikes or yoga classes or baseball games, whatever it is that you do. And then all of a sudden you have a kid or three and free time, we like to say, becomes like domestic gold. It becomes this scarce resource. And I'll never forget, we were interviewing this one woman who was telling us on a Saturday, she went to Target by herself, got home and her husband was like, all right, I'm going to go for a run now because you just had your free time. She's like, no, I, that was not free time. That was me going to Target. From his perspective, that was free time. She was alone without the kids. So you can see how free time becomes another battlefield for this discussion over fairness, what is or isn't fair. And so now we want to invite you into an inquiry. If you are joining us together as a partnership, you might turn to your partner and have this conversation. If you're here solo, you might do the reflection on a sheet of paper and share it with your partner later. Our curiosity is how does fairness around parenting in particular show up for you and your partner? And we'll give you a minute or so to have the conversation and to reflect what's your particular flavor of fairness. If you are so inclined, please feel free to share your thoughts and reflections with us in the Q&A or in the chat. Otherwise, focus on that conversation with your partner. Okay, so now is a good time to be just wrapping up that conversation, and hopefully you were able to find some areas where this 
fairness fight or fairness conversation is coming up for you around parenting. So the big question now becomes, okay, why isn't this working? Because it really feels like this should work. This is, as I said before, it's like the center of gravity for most relationships that we tend to default to. And we want to just talk a little bit about a couple of the reasons why this doesn't work. And that's going to set the stage for an alternative model, our 8080 model. And one of the things that's really interesting is there has been an emerging body of research in psychology showing that when it comes to our assessments of what is or isn't fair in our relationship in particular, we are extremely bad at making these judgments, deluded in fact. And the reason is there are a couple cognitive biases at work that are clouding our vision of how all this works. So the first is what cognitive psychologists call availability bias. That's just a fancy way of saying that all of the wonderful things that I do for our marriage and our life, all of those things are available to me. Like I saw that I picked up our daughter I saw that I helped our daughter make lunch, that I made her breakfast this morning. All of that is available to me. But when it comes to what Kaylee does, I mean, it starts to get a little bit fuzzy, right? There's, there's actually a lot of it that I don't even see or even know about. So as a result, I tend to systematically underestimate my partner's contributions. So that's bias one. Bias two, which makes this even worse, is an overestimation bias. So what psychologists have found is that when it comes to estimating the amount of time we spend doing work at the office, we're pretty good. We actually, you know, we say we worked for two hours, we're pretty accurate. But when it comes to things like household work and childcare, we tend to radically overestimate the amount of time we spend on it. And both genders do this, but men do it more, quite a bit more. And so the result is, that we're overestimating how much time and effort we're putting into parenting or we're putting into you know, housework. And so these two biases combine together and the result is both partners think they're doing more. Both partners have no idea what the other partner is doing. And that's why this conversation just never ends and this argument is really intractable. Like, we are having this argument on the basis of really bad data and utter delusion in a way. And so what's the alternative? Instead of striving for 50-50 fairness, in the 80-80 marriage, we strive to contribute 80%. And when both sides are striving to, con to contribute 80%, we land in a mindset of radical generosity. Earlier today, I was at a conference of entrepreneurs, and much of the day was focused on this question of mindset, that it's really the foundation upon which everything else is built, that unless we're willing to take a look at how we're showing up in our relationship, the glasses through which we see our relationship, we actually can't do very much to change the structure of how we engage together. So if we look in a little bit more detail, it's easy to say, we'll just show up with a mindset of radical generosity. But what that means in practice has three distinct parts. The first part is that of contribution. What are you doing? How are you giving to your relationship? Some of this can be through acts of service. It could be the financial contribution you make to the family. It might be the domestic tasks that you do but it's also the small ways that you contribute to your relationship, how you're paying attention. But if Nate just turns on the coffee in the morning, that's a huge deal for me. That absolutely feels like love. If I notice that something is missing and I go get it, or I move something to a place where it belongs and let him know, these small ways that we're paying attention and generously offering, generously contributing is one leg of the stool. The second is that of appreciation. What are the glasses through which I see my partner? What we've noticed is that if we go looking for ways that our partners have messed up, or fallen short, or done something wrong, you better believe that I can find them. And I have a particular knack for criticism, I would say. Very good. At Excellent. It. Yes. And so if I go looking for what's wrong, you better believe I can find it. That said, if I shift what I'm looking for, 
If I go on a scavenger hunt for things that Nate has done well, I also find those. And the piece of radical generosity that is appreciation is then vocalizing those things that I've noticed, making sure that Nate also knows what I appreciate. That can be certainly with our partners and also for our kids, for the rest of our family. The third leg of the stool is that of revealing. Some of this is around the places where we don't see eye to eye or where there's been conflict in the relationship, letting our partners know that something didn't land well or that our feelings have been hurt. That's a critical element of revealing. The other piece though that we certainly think has not gotten enough credit is revealing what's happening in your inner world. That for some people, especially when you're time starved and it feels like there's so much going on, it's pretty easy just to collapse into bed at the end of the night and say, I love you, sleep well, and roll over. Instead, what we invite for that deeper sense of connection is to ask one different question, to reveal something about what happened in your inner world today. Today, I felt really supported when a friend of ours came and cheered me on at an event. Or today, I felt really disappointed that a person didn't do what they said they were going to do. That's a different conversation than, how was your day? Fine. How was your day? <laughs> Fine. These three together create that foundation of mindset because the building blocks that we're about to discuss, the ways that you put 80-80 marriage into practice in the world, they don't work unless you have this mindset first. And so to get a little practice, we wanna invite you to appreciate. Again, if you're here with your partner, we invite you to turn to them and say one thing you appreciate about how they show up as a parent. If your partner isn't with you right now, you could write it on a piece of paper and save it to make their night. Or if you promise to come back and not start scrolling Twitter, you could send them a text with an appreciation. One of the things that we noticed in our family is that when we started to get in the habit of appreciating, and we do it every night before we fall asleep, just one appreciation for each other, it allowed us to complete our days on a high note, on a point of connection. We also got really into the sticky note that we started leaving sticky notes of appreciation around the house. And our 10-year-old got really excited about it. And she started to say, I can leave appreciation sticky notes. And so we would start to find them in various places, on our computer monitor, in a purse, sometimes in a shoe. And what was really powerful is that in shifting the entire mindset of the family to that of appreciation, it became contagious for everyone. Okay, so hopefully you had time to at least share a couple appreciations. And one of the things just to notice is that appreciation high that happens afterwards. There is something about really taking in an appreciation from your spouse that is so powerful. So now we want to talk about the second piece of this model. As Kaylee mentioned, it all starts with mindset, right? that if we're caught in that 50-50 fairness mindset, it becomes very difficult to talk about some of the more logistical, tactical, structural areas of our life because the whole conversation becomes about fairness. And that's all we can think about and resentment seeps in and it just doesn't work very well. So mindset is primary. We need to shift that first. But then 
there are all of these questions about given the insanity that is modern life and all the things we have to do together as a family, how do we bring more intentionality to the structure of our lives? And that's really where we want to spend the second part of the talk. And we're actually going to do an experience around this. But before we do, we wanted to just outline the sort of key pieces of what we think of as the 8080 structure. And a couple of things, just preliminary things here. One thing I always like to say is you can think of structure in this scenario as a shift from unconsciousness, which is the way most marriages and, and parenting arrangements are organized. We just kind of slip into them by random accident. We call it the winged approach, right? And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's the way it usually happens. So we're shifting from that unconscious state to a more conscious or intentional state around these areas. And we think it all starts with values. So understanding what your values are as a couple. We like to think of this as understanding what's the game we're trying to win together and how we know that we've won together. And there are no better or worse values. Some couples, their value is adventure. They travel the world. For other couples, it's generating wealth. For other couples, it's family time. The key is to just have some clarity on what our values are. And from values, then we start to go through these various structures, all of which play a huge role in our parenting and in our marriage. What we've also noticed is that values is not a one and done conversation. That as you have different chapters of your life, perhaps there's a chapter where your kiddos are all in diapers, or there might be a chapter of your life where it's really about your kids in school. There might be a different chapter at Empty Nest or a different chapter if you move to a different city. That anytime there's a significant change in your life, it's worth coming back to this conversation. And if you want a little bit more assistance, you can certainly find an exercise around defining, articulating, and living by your values in the book. Yeah. And, and really, when it comes to all of these areas, we've created practices that you and your partner can do together, exercises that are all in the book, as Kaylee mentioned. But I'll just briefly go through a couple of these structural pieces. One is roles. Um, roles is probably the predominant place where couples apply that winged approach I was talking about before, where, you know, just random accident determines who does what. So there's an opportunity here to get more intentional about how you divide up roles or how you uh, think about roles in your relationship. The second is priorities. We think of this as what are the things you're saying yes to? This is essential because so many couples now are bombarded with so much information and invitations and requests and demands coming from all sorts of places, it can be so powerful to get clear on, hey, what are our priorities that are based on our values? What is it that we want to say yes to? I'm going to skip boundaries because we're actually going to come back and do an exercise on boundaries, but I just want to briefly mention the other two. Power turns out to be a huge point of contention in many relationships especially when there are asymmetries in power around things like money or around control. So really taking a closer look at power and how do you neutralize some of those asymmetrical structures of power. And then this last one, you're probably wondering, why is sex a structural piece of the 80-80 marriage? Well, we have a thesis that the way to have amazing intimacy isn't to get really good at sex or to apply Cosmo Magazine's top 10 tips. It's actually to streamline all these other areas of life because when we're able to shift to that 88 mindset, when we're able to bring more intentionality to these various areas, all of a sudden we reduce the friction and the resentment that arises in everyday life and we can be available to each other. And that is actually the best way to enhance our intimacy. So now we're going to go to boundaries. Yeah. So the question of boundaries is really the reciprocal of the question of priorities. That if priorities are what are the things that we want to say yes to? What are the things that we want to make sure that we're prioritizing, enhancing, focused on? Boundaries are the things that we're willing to say no to. 
And I just like to mention for all the folks in the room who share this experience, I find that no is a much harder word, especially in the moment where when the pressure is there, when the request is there, the temptation, whether it's for someone liking us or for appeasing something or to avoid conflict, the temptation in the moment is almost always to say yes. And yet the sacrifice to the couple, the sacrifice to the family is often quite great. And so in this notion of boundaries, we want to pay attention to what are all the things that perhaps by history, perhaps by appeasement, we have said yes to? And what are the ways that we can start to call that list so that we're more intentional? For our exercise today, we want to encourage you now, please do grab that sheet of paper and whatever it is you're writing with, a pen or a pencil. And we're going to encourage you to think of your life like a boat. And so if you want to imagine, you can draw for yourself a pretty makeshift boat. You'll notice that our artistic skills are somewhat limited. And the idea in creating a boat is that we want now to write all the things that we are presently doing in our lives, close enough to scale. Now, one of the things that's interesting is to scale might be the actual minutes that I invest in that activity. And to scale might be the emotional energy that I'm investing in that activity. To illustrate, Nate actually created his boat for us. You want to talk us through it? Yes. And I made this very sloppy so that you all feel really good about your boats. <laughs> so you're welcome. Uh, but as you can see, I have my little boat here. And as Kayla was mentioning, I tried to draw everything to scale. And this is not aspirational at all. This first boat is what's actually happening. So you wanna be as honest with yourself as possible. So you can see that one of the biggest things, perhaps the biggest thing is email is taking up a huge amount of time. And um, family time is actually smaller than the amount of time I spend on email. And then I have things like news addiction and my Netflix addiction and managing house stuff. And then you'll see at the bottom there in very small letters, there's this thing called reading. <laughs> which I very rarely have time for, and travel, which was obliterated for the last couple of years, and hobbies. So again, the idea here is just to, to write out your boat, which is kind of like a breakdown of where your life energy and time goes. I just noticed that there's no parenting on your boat. Yeah. That's so interesting. Apparently I don't parent. <laughs> <laughs> and so we'll be quiet for a few minutes, give you an opportunity to create your own boat. If you're here with your partner, we encourage you to each do your own individual boat first for the, pro for the promise of a conversation, just to understand how you're each seeing things. So you'll have about four or so minutes to create your own boat. Yeah, and if you are struggling with categories, we have these sample categories over there. Those are meant to be prompts, not to be complete. Exactly.
hopefully you've had a chance to at least start to draw your boat, to start to explore some of the things that are on there. And we wanna invite you now to have a quick conversation with your partner or to reflect on your own about what you notice. Where are you finding as you draw that there's too much of something? That as you're being honest with yourself, that fearless moral inventory, if you will, you recognize, oh my goodness, that is much smaller than I would like it to be. Or wow, I didn't realize how much of my brain space this topic was taking up. You might also consider what are some of the things that are on the boat that you don't just want to right size, you want to kick off the boat all together. And so invite you into a reflection on your own, or if your partner is there, you might share your boats. What we would avoid in this moment is criticizing your partner's boat. That's not how much time you actually spend, but rather to be in the inquiry. Huh, is that how that feels? I noticed that there's no parenting on your boat. Just to be in that dialogue, to start to right size, to start to get curious, to recognize where might some boundaries make sense. So we'll give you about three or so minutes, our left and our five. Excuse me. All right, so now is probably a good time to finish up that last thought. Hopefully that conversation was helpful, useful to you. So now we wanna go to the final step of the process. And we love this exercise. And the reason we did it with you tonight is we want you to leave with this, which is we now want you to write out what we like to call your dream boat. So the first boat, was a real-time analysis of how your energy is, is diffused and spent in your ordinary life. The second boat is the boat you want to have, your more ideal boat that reflects your priorities, but also your boundaries, some of the things that you're going to say no to. So I'm going to give you my example here again. You'll see that reading went from this microscopic thing at the very bottom of my boat to being a much more substantial piece of where I spend my time and energy. And email shifted in the opposite direction. It went from being actually the highest 
or the, the largest circle to having a smaller role in my life. I don't think I could ever get rid of email entirely, but you see how that works. And then finally, you'll see that there are a couple of things that I decided to kick off the boat entirely. Can I kick my news addiction and Netflix binging? That's a big ask. I'm not sure if it's possible, but for me, that would actually be a huge game changer. So we want to give you a few minutes now just to start sketching out what this dream boat would look like for you. You can save some of the practicality, things like how Nate created different inboxes so that he wasn't tempted by his email. Those practicalities are important, but can follow once you've defined what are you striving to create so you can align your actions and habits behind it. With the caveat that two minutes is probably insufficient time to create your dream boat appropriately to scale, we hope that at least you got it started. The other piece that we just want to remind you is that as you continue this forward, it's important to remember what boundaries will you need to set with life to turn this into a reality. That in order for me to have the time that I desire with my family, I might need to set a boundary where I say, I'm not willing to serve on the school PTA committee anymore. Or I might need to hold a boundary that says, I am turning off my phone notifications that after 7 p.m., I'm gonna be unreachable by my colleagues. My experience with these boundaries and our experience as we talk with couples around boundaries is this is where the rubber hits the road. So first, it requires you recognizing where you are, designing what you want, and then being really clear, what boundaries are you willing to set? And as you do that, you're really able to see how could your life be different and how might that improvement around your life, around aligning your choices with your values, with your priorities, allows you to be the quality of partner and parent that you most want to be. So we just want to wrap up this section of the talk. We're going to do Q&A in a moment with a challenge for you. And this is, think of it as an invitation. You can accept the invitation if you would like or not. But one of the things we found is that sometimes when it comes particularly to our relationships, it actually takes a little bit of work to create these habits and to sort of weave them into the everyday fabric of our lives. So our challenge is really about that. We wanna give you a few different habits to explore and you really only need to do it for a week, see if they work for you. But we, we think it could be really powerful to try to build these habits for the next week. So 
Here's what we're inviting you to do. First of all, radical generosity. So the idea here is to do something radically generous for your partner each day. And as Kaylee mentioned earlier, this doesn't have to be huge. This doesn't have to be concert tickets with backstage passes. This can be a cup of coffee, right? But those micro moments of radical generosity are so powerful and so profound and they're contagious, in fact. Your partner can't help but respond in kind. So that's habit one. Habit two is about appreciation. For every day in the next week, what would happen if you looked, as Kaylee said, through the glasses of appreciation for what your partner did right and gave them a thank you? One way tactically to do this that Kaylee and I do is every night before we go to bed, we do one appreciation for each other. It takes probably 30 seconds. And yet it's this way of ending our day on a note of appreciation. And here again, you're sort of building this fabric together of a radically generous mindset. And then finally, we just went through the exercise of the boat and you likely found something that you either wanted to reduce or kick off your boat entirely. So maybe pick that one thing that you think if it were no longer on your boat would give you so much more time and so much more energy. See what happens when just for the next week you kick that thing off your boat or reduce the size of that substantially. So that's our invitation for you for the next week. And you might notice that these small acts have a huge impact on your relationship together and even just on your own experience in your relationship. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And so now we wanna move over to Q&A. We'll stop sharing our slides so that we can pay attention to the questions that you've asked. And some of these were sent in advance. We appreciate those of you who sent some of those. So picking up from those that were sent earlier, one of the questions that we were asked is how to move from tit for tat scorekeeping on tasks, duties, chores, et cetera, under the unrelenting pressures of full-time jobs, caregiving for multiple toddlers, being transplants without support and financial challenges. And we think that this question is really at the heart of the shift in mindset from fairness, from 50-50 to 80-80, that the ability to let go of the notion that it even should be fair and rather to look for ways that how can I be of service to my partner? How can they be of service to me that when we both show up that way, all of the scorekeeping actually drops away. And what comes in its place is gratitude. Gratitude for emptying the dishwasher while I was taking care of a kid and getting them ready for school. And that the idea is also around approaching it as a team. How can we win together rather than feeling like I'm doing one thing, you're doing another thing, and either I win and you lose or you win and I lose. And instead to say, if we're a team, how do we win together? Yeah, that's great. So there's another question that I feel like has come up about three or four different times and different formulations. But the basic question is, how do we deal with different parenting styles mm -hmm. in a marriage? Um, this seems to be a really big topic for many of you. And I think this is a, a really important question to ask because it shows up in most relationships. And I would say there are two things you can consider here. One is to make that shift from unconsciousness to consciousness. So in other words, bringing more conversation and intentionality to this debate you might be having over the best way to raise your child. And what that looks like is really revealing when your partner's parenting style makes you feel uncomfortable or revealing what you, how you think about parenting, having that conversation about your respective philosophies of parenting. Mm -hmm. So you can really understand each other and understand the difference. Mm -hmm. So I think that's step one is just really trying to understand what are the differences? Why do we have these different beliefs? But then step two is really shifting the frame around how you see these differences. So I think the conventional frame that we default to is that difference is bad and wouldn't it be amazing if we just had exactly the same parenting philosophy? But I think if you take a closer look, it's often the case that these differences are actually quite beneficial to our kids. 
that there's actually beauty in the difference. So that would be the second step is to really try to see like, how are these differences actually serving our children and serving us? Mm -hmm. And I think if you can use those two shifts, all of a sudden, you're not going to get rid of the difference, but you're going to see it differently. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I notice it's also, it's sometimes hard to find that appreciation. How do I appreciate that my partner yells and that makes me feel uncomfortable to really look at it and say, our kids are going to have the ability or the skill to be in the presence of anger, or our kids are going to know how to use their voices. Sometimes you need to go looking, but there's always something there if you're genuine in the inquiry. There's a question here that I personally quite love, which is what do you do with a partner who has great intentions, but they don't have the tools to succeed? Meaning if I let them do it, I would actually end up project managing their efforts. So what do you, how do you do that? Interestingly, in our relationship, once upon a time, I would argue that I was that partner and Sweet Nate had great intentions, but wow, he could not manage our finances to save his life. And every time he cleaned something, I just really found a lot of things wrong with it. Totally true. And the shift occurred when I became willing. So the partner who I had the tools, I had the skills, I had the initiative, I needed to be willing, one, to let it be done differently that if it had to be my way, I was gonna create a power structure that really bred a lot of resentment. And secondly, I needed to be willing to cede control. And that was the hardest one for me that all of a sudden I wasn't able to know every detail, that it wasn't always my way. Only when I was willing to let go of control and actually train on the skills. This is how I manage our finances, or this is how I think about the way that we're putting our money places so that we have security. Only when I was willing to kind of let him all the way in, which in the moment was quite vulnerable, then could I turn it over with that feeling of confidence. Yeah, that is definitely a good accounting of what happened. (laughs) Okay, so there's a great question here on advice on how to start connecting with your partner when you have little kids and full-time jobs. And I love this. The person says, don't say date night. (laughs) Does it get easier when the kids are older? So this is such a great question because as we were talking about before, all of a sudden with kids in a marriage, time becomes scarce, both for ourselves, but also for each other. There's just less time for us to connect. And so I'm going to avoid saying date night here and offer some other ideas. So the first idea goes back to this principle of revealing that we were talking about earlier, which is one of the key aspects of radical generosity. One of the things we have found, we actually have a name for this, is that many couples at the end of the day will have what we call a conversation about the weather, which is like, oh, it was really windy out today, wasn't it? Oh, I hope it rains. It's been really dry here. Yeah, Yeah. boy. Mm could be some fire danger. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So that's the kind of conversation. And again, at the end of a stressful day, we default to this kind of conversation. There's an opportunity here to shift the way we have this conversation so that we're asking questions that go beyond just an accounting of what happened during the day, that go beyond things happening in the external world, news or current events, and they go into the inner world, right? Like, how are you really doing today? How, how did that presentation you gave today land with the audience? How did you feel afterwards? What are you thinking about right now? What are your dreams in the next few years? It's a different style of question, which can really change the level of connection because you're no longer talking about the outer world. You're talking about the inner world. And that's really where connection comes from. So that would be the first thing. But then the second thing is you can have these micro moments of connection, think of them as like micro date nights that don't involve getting a babysitter and going out for Friday night, but are like walking around the block for 10 minutes or making sure that you have those 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the night before you go to bed. It's it's thinking about priorities and really thinking about how do you place connection on your boat in a way that it actually happens. And it could just be 15 minutes. 10 minutes, five minutes even, but thinking about sort of these more micro scale versions of a date night. Yeah. The other thing that I notice is 
occasionally for me, especially in the morning, I get in a hurry. And so I'm sort of moving from the shower to the kitchen, to the car, to the whatever. And Nate will catch me and give me just a little hug and be like, I love you. Have a great day. And there's that interruption to the pace that can actually create a really significant moment of connection. That it doesn't have to be a long, deep stare into one another's eyes. That's awkward. (laughs) But rather that sense of just a micro moment of connection that can actually be contagious for the rest of the relationship. There are lots more really wonderful questions, but in order to honor your time, we're going to pause there. Thank you so much, Nate and Keely. You guys are absolutely outstanding and have so many great tips. Um, I'm a parent with two little ones, three and five, and I was taking so many notes. So thank you for your time tonight. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us. Special thank you to our media partners, our event sponsors. And again, thank you, Nate and Keely. Um, Questions for you, Nate and Keely. If attendees want more resources, where should we direct them? Yeah, well, as we said earlier, the book is probably the primary resource. You can get that wherever books are sold, The 8080 Marriage. We also have some free guides available on our website. So we have an epic date night guide, uh, and that's at 8080marriage.com, 8080marriage.com. And then we're also on Instagram, where we do daily challenges for people looking for little things that they can do each day. Excellent. Thank you again. And we hope to see everyone else at our next current ed talk on June 7th, Screen Time Reset, with our Seattle children's expert, Dr. Dimitri Kostakis. Uh, Again, everyone, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nate and Kaylee, and we will see you all soon. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening.